LaunchDarkly enables development and operations teams to deploy code at any time, even if a feature isn't ready to be released to users. Wrapping code with feature flags gives you the safety to test new features and infrastructure in your production environments without impacting the wrong end users. Learn more at LaunchDarkly.com. Among other things, service meshes move code used for wiring and the telemetry of services out of application level logic, where they've traditionally been included in things like libraries, into a whole new layer, most often implemented with proxies, typically called sidecars. A lot has been written about service meshes. A recent CNCF survey shows kind of the uptick in it, with 27% of respondents say they are using service meshes today. That's up 50% from the previous year. But what is a service mesh? What are these things called SAR cards and why do they all matter? Today on the podcast, we're talking about service message and more specifically diving into Linkerd with William Morgan of Buoyant. Hi, my name is Wes Rice. I'm one of the co-hosts of the podcast and chair of the first QCon Plus event that was held in November of last year. Speaking of that, there's another QCon Plus planned for May of 2021, held between May 17th and May 28th. This spring version of QCon Plus will be held over two weeks, and in just a few hours a day will feature 16 tracks curated by domain experts to help you focus on the topics that matter right now in software development. These are things like leading full cycle engineering teams, modern data pipelines, and building continuous delivery systems, workflows, and the platforms used to build all of these things. If you're a senior software engineer, architect, or team lead, take a look at QCon.plus for more information. As I mentioned, today on the podcast, we're talking with William Morgan. William is the CEO of Buoyant, um, who is one of the leading manufacturers of a service mesh called Linkerd. Uh, Linkerd, according to that survey that I mentioned before, has a market share of about 41%. Today, we're going to dive into some details of Linkerd. We're going to talk a bit about it's the service mesh Linkerd and also the larger service mesh space. We'll talk about things like William's thoughts around important concerns that deal with things like latency and cost, both in cloud service bill and in the human cost. We'll talk a bit about the birth and evolution of Linkerd. We'll talk about some of the design principles and details. Linkerd uses Rust in the data plane and Go in the control plane. We'll talk a bit about why that is and some of the decisions made along the way. We'll also talk about the importance of security and zero trust configuration as we leverage service mesh. As always, thank you so much for joining us on your jogs, walks, and commutes. So, William, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Wes. Great to be here. I kind of attribute my definition of service mesh to stuff I've heard you talk about or seen you write about, and it's loosely described this way. It's dedicated infrastructure layer, often implemented with sidecar proxies, not always, but often for implementing east to west, service to service traffic. And it kind of separates business logic from like networking plumbing or plumbing to make things work correctly. I've paraphrased that quite a bit, but what is your definition today? How do you define service mesh? Yeah, I think what you said was a pretty good definition. I think, you know, if anything, what it is missing is the value, like the why, you know. Yeah, totally. What's a car? Well, it's four wheels and like some seats and a, and a steering wheel. Okay, well, it's good, but, like, you know, why is a car? The so what, right? Yeah, and so for me, you know, whenever I talk about what a service mesh is, I kind of start with something like that and I immediately follow up with, and the reason why it's important is because it gives you a bunch of features that you otherwise would have to have at the application level and instead gives those to you at the platform level. And that shift in where it's located in the stack is a profound value of the service mesh. And there's a reason why we go through all these crazy pains to implement it in this insane way with all these proxies and stuff that from the outside probably looks a little weird. And to be real clear, you're talking things like discovery. You're talking like application patterns, like circuit breakers and resiliency features like that, right? Yeah, that's right. That kind of stuff, you know, the observability side of things, things like success rates and latencies and request tracing. And then even on the security side, things like mutual TLS. Yeah, definitely. I want to dive into security. I think there's some interesting conversations that we can have on that front. So the CNCF Cloud Native Survey for 2020 came out, I think, in November. It's taken some time around May and June. But in it, it listed 27% of respondents, again, respondents to the CNCF survey, but 27% of respondents are using service mesh in production, 50% increase over last year. Um, they expect the growth to continue with 23% evaluating a service mesh and another 19% kind of planning to use it in the next 12 months. 
why? Is that these things, these features that you were talking about before that we kind of kicked this off with, is that what's driving this kind of moving that stuff out of the application tier and putting it into kind of this infrastructure layer? You know, I think it's mostly there's all these blog posts about it. And so <laughs> that you're writing, right? If you want to keep up with the Joneses, then you got to quickly add a service mesh to your stack. And who cares what it does? You got to check that box. No, more seriously, although we actually do see some of that approach, sadly, in some of the service mesh adoption, I think the reality is the service mesh is just a really convenient way to get a set of features that you really do need, right? And there's not really a good alternative to that other than implementing all that stuff, as I said, in the application. And that can be done. Certainly, that's kind of the traditional approach, but it's not great. You know, there's a pretty significant cost of implementing a service mesh. So I do expect that trend to continue because in the cloud native space, whether you like it or not, you're going to end up using one because it's just a better trade-off than any other trade-off you can make. Yeah. And now that we have the network in the mix rather than doing just calls inside of a processor. Right. Right. At what point do you think it becomes important to really start to look at a service mesh? At what point does the overhead of the things that you're doing in the application start to become enough that it makes sense to really implement a service mesh. But I mean, are we talking dozens or hundreds, or do you think it's always good to start there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of factors that go into it. And I touch a little bit, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I wrote a very lengthy meshifesto on servicemesh.io, which I think now redirects to a buoyant page. But, you know, I, I try and outline some of the factors that go into it there. I think certainly, you know, your application and kind of the structure of your application is a big one. If you have a monolith, service mesh is not going to do a lot for you because the way that it adds its features is by adding them to those connections between services. So you have to be running microservices. I think another big factor is if you are running in an environment like Kubernetes, because what Kubernetes gives us is the ability to implement a service mesh in a way that actually is not that painful for you, right? You know, when we talk about deploying thousands of, you know, sidecar micro proxies or whatever it is we do with Linkerd, we can do that basically transparently in Kubernetes because there's a lot of, you know, features we can build on top of and set the network routing rules and all that stuff kind of automatically for you. If you are in a different environment where you don't have those primitives, then yes, you can do a service mesh, but the cost, the deploy time cost and the operational cost is going to be significantly higher. And I think that changes the equation. So in my mind, I think it really comes down to, yes, what's the structure of your application? And then are you in an environment that makes it easy to add a service mesh? And if you're not, the cost you know, might outweigh the benefits. Let's talk about that for a second. So one of the first pushbacks you hear from a company who might be particularly a smaller, maybe startup, maybe cost averse company, when you start talking about a service mesh, that means that we're going to double the number of containers that we're running on our environment. It's going to be a lot more expensive to be able to run this. What's the response when someone brings up that argument? The easiest response is like, what is the actual cost for you? You know, is it the compute cost or is it the human cost? And I think in almost every environment, the human cost is the thing that dominates. And so that's what you want to solve. And then maybe the other response there is, where do you want to spend your innovation tokens? You know, do you want to spend that on inventing basic infrastructure, you know, and having your developers write, you know, retry logic and have to get that right in a big distributed system? Or do you want to just like get the best practices implemented for you and spend your mental energies on the actual logic of your business? Wonderful answer. The next question is latency, right? With sidecar model, what, I guess, is your response when people talk about, yeah, but there's a performance cost here. That's certainly true. And in fact, the service mesh, you know, it's not like you're just adding one proxy between every hop. You're adding two proxies, right? We've got both <laughs> the client side and the server side. And so when we think about not the human cost, which I still think is the most important thing to consider, but when we think about the kind of machine cost, there's three things. There's a latency, there's memory consumption, there's CPU consumption. And you're going to pay a price, you know, as with any piece of technology. It's not like that's new to the service mesh. You're adding stuff. If you added the stuff in library form, then you'd pay those costs too, maybe less so. And so that's all part of the cost benefit analysis. I will say on the Linkerd side, we are extremely aware of the resource and the latency costs. And we do a whole lot of work, especially in the proxy side to minimize those things so that you end up with what we call a micro proxy that's extremely fast and extremely lightweight, has a really, really fantastically good profile, but it's not zero by any means. Yeah, totally. I've got that down. Actually, I want to talk to you a bit about 
you talked earlier about all the cool kids doing certain things. You're not using Envoy. So I want to <laughs> dive in and specifically talk about that and talk a bit about the implementation with Rust because that fascinates me. And I've heard, at least you can verify, but Linkerd is one of the most, if not the most performant of any of the service meshes that at least I'm tracking. I believe that's the case. Benchmarking any piece of software is a art form as well as a science. And we do our own internal benchmarks, which gives me confidence in that answer. But there's always situations where you can find a particular scenario where something else is better. But I do believe that overall, yeah, Linkerd is the most performant and has the least resource consumption, which, you know, that's all stuff that I'm very proud of. Although, honestly, again, I would sacrifice that in the interest of human facing simplicity. And happily, we haven't really had to make that sacrifice, but I would. As I was kind of doing a little bit of research prepping to this, I read in a blog, I think, and I wish I had captured better notes so I could quote the log, but I think it talked about Linkerd as being a service mesh that was relentlessly focused on simplicity and user-friendliness. Is that a design principle of Linkerd? I love that blog post already. Did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> you may have. <laughs> Yeah, that's 100% right. And that has been a design principle, I want to say since the beginning, but really since the kind of 2.x rewrite, because we went through this transformation from the 1.x branch, which was quite different to 2.x. But in the modern Linkerd, yeah, 100%. Our focus first and foremost is on simplicity and on reducing the human cost to operating a service mesh, because we have this fundamental belief that the service mesh doesn't have to be complicated you know, which makes Linkerd a weird project because that whole space, you know, the whole term service mesh now is so like synonymous with complexity and weirdness. And, you know, here we are trying our best to fight against that. It doesn't have to be that way. And I think we've demonstrated with Linkerd that doesn't actually have to be complex. Yeah, very nice. I want to talk a bit about security, but before we do that, you mentioned a little bit before about libraries and things being maybe in this network mesh as well. You also kind of just mentioned some transformation with Linkerd1 to Conduit to 2. So I kind of wanted to spend a minute and go back and just talk about where Linkerd came from all the way back to like finagle days forward. I thought we might trace a little bit on that. Could you talk a little bit about where Linkerd came from, kind of its origin story? Uh, you want the ancient history. Well, I have, you know, again, again, not tuning my own horn, but I have a very nice article up on InfoQ about this. Yeah, I, I can. Is that where that uh -huh. is? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the reason I want you to go through it, though, is because I think in a lot of ways, the stages that you're about to talk about show a lot about the journey from libraries to what is now a current modern service mesh. Yeah. You know, the short story is Linkerd1.x, you know, which maybe I'll call ancient Linkerd, although it still powers some pretty huge deployments, you know, around the world. It came out of this project that we were very familiar with at Twitter, which is where Oliver and, and myself, kind of the, the initial Linkerd creators worked. We came out of this project called Finagle, which you mentioned. And Finagle was a Scala library that was powering and I think continues to power Twitter's infrastructure. And the very first version of Linkerd was literally Finagle, you know, just wrapped up in proxy form. So Finagle has all these beautiful programming idioms about doing functional programming and RPC calls. We just like threw that all away. We said, just give us the operational side of things. Give us the retries and the timeouts and the load balancing and, and so on. So that first Linkerd was just that, you know, yeah, was, was Finagle in a box. But Finagle was a library that was included with the projects, the services at Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There was no sidecar proxy or even, you know, that wasn't really an idea that was too much in our heads when we were at Twitter because Twitter had just mandated like, hey, guess what? If you're writing a service, it's going to be on the JVM. But that speaks to that move about moving things out of the application and into this other service layer. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, Scala library, <laughs> you know, for doing like functional programming on RPC calls, you know, <laughs> it's like the audience who can make use of that directly, you know, is pretty limited. But once you wrap it up in a proxy, and especially, you know, the thing that really happened at that point was the rise of Docker, you know, and containers, all of a sudden, you know, it didn't matter what this thing was written in, you just stick it in a container and you stick it next to your application. And then the rise of Kubernetes, and now we've got these nice networking controls where we can just transparently wire stuff up. And all of a sudden, you've got this way of doing what's effectively like runtime binding of functionality. And that's what ended up really driving momentum on Linkerd. So then there was Linkerd, the classic version, as you kind of mentioned. I don't think you used the word classic, but the classic version you mentioned. Then Conduit came about, and then the two merged into Linkerd. What happened there? 
<laughs> yeah, I feel like Obi Wan Kenobi. And I'm like, oh, that's a name I have not heard in a long time. So yeah, you know, around the time that Linkerd, the 1.x finagle based version, was really taking off, we were already aware that the JVM was awesome at scaling up, but it was very poor at scaling down. And so we had put a lot of engineering resources in it, but we couldn't really get the proxy itself to get under you know 150 megs, maybe under 120. And so that was okay for people who were running these giant three gig JVM apps, but there was an audience who were writing their microservices in Go and they're like 50 megs and you couldn't really ask them to run this 150 meg proxy next to their 50 meg service instance and be like, hey, it's this transparent proxy. You don't have to worry about it. So we knew we had to rewrite it. And then the other thing, maybe even more profound than that, was that having brought that thing into the world, we saw how people were struggling to adopt it. I mean, it was in production use, but it was much harder to get there than it should be. In part, because I think what we had done is we'd basically taken every possible finagle feature that we had our hands on and just like exposed it as like, here's a giant YAML file. And so when we set about to rewrite this thing, and by the way, you should never do this, right? <laughs> it's like <laughs> second system syndrome. You know, you can like literally look it up on Wikipedia. It's like, here's what you should never do. Take a functioning thing and then rewrite it from scratch. There's no way that'll ever work. So, you know, like idiots, we did, we did it anyways. And I guess we happened to happen to make it work. But we knew that there were two things we had to fix. Number one, we had to get off the JVM. Like we just, that was not a path forward for us. And then number two, we had to make it simple. We had to make it something that could actually be adopted, you know, in the order of minutes rather than the order of months. And so all of those design principles, you know, went into what is the modern version of Linkerd. I think we're up to 2.9 as of last month, which has a control plane written in Go, kind of the lingua franca of Kubernetes, and then a data plane written in Rust. So you talked a little bit before about the micro proxy, about this Rust proxy. So I'm curious about some of the design decisions that you all had when you were going about creating this. So questions that come to mind. Why Rust, for example? Oh, I don't know. We just picked, you know. <laughs> Seemed like the thing to go. <laughs> <laughs> we read this Hacker News, you know, blog post and sounded pretty good. So actually, you know, we made this call in 2018 and it was pretty scary at the time because, you know, fast forward two years, Rust has got crazy momentum. It's got this very well-developed ecosystem of networking libraries. In fact, I think the most modern kind of asynchronous network programming engineering is all happening in Rust right now. So that's a really exciting ecosystem to be a part of. But 2018, it was like barely there. You know, we're like, holy moly, here's this language. And if we go down this path, you know, we're going to have to do a bunch of investment into like core networking libraries. It's not like we get to just wrap Finagle in a box anymore. We're going to be like figuring out how to deal with bits and bytes and move them around between thread pools or like whatever, you know, I don't know how any of this stuff actually works, <laughs> whatever happens in that proxy. But the thing that was so compelling for us about Rust was that it had two things that we, well, maybe three things that we really looked for. And the third was maybe less important. So the first thing was it allowed us to write native code proxy. So we could compile these things down just like with C or C++. We can compile these things down to basically about as fast as a computer can execute them, right? There's no managed environment. Even something like Go has a managed environment. It's got the garbage collector. All that stuff gets complicated when you're trying to develop these really low latency network proxies because, you know, every once in a while, the garbage collector will rear its ugly head and then it's like oh, an additional, you know, 100 milliseconds of latency and then your tail latency looks crappy and like that's a problem. So we needed to have really fine-grained control of memory usage, especially so we could do allocations and deallocations on a per-request basis and amortize all that stuff and have a really sharp distribution. And then the other thing that was really compelling for us and why we ended up on Rust instead of C or C++ was the memory safety guarantees. So, you know, the data plane of a service mesh, that's the critical component here. That's where our users, their HIPAA data or their PCI data or their financial transactions are going through the data plane. And so any kind of vulnerability there is like, it's a huge, huge problem. And so what Rust allowed us to do was to sidestep this entire class of like kind of endemic problems in, in C and C++ programs around memory access and buffer overflow exploits and, you know, those sorts of CVEs. So it was really the right combination of those two things. And then, you know, it was also kind of a nice language for us coming to it from Scala. You know, it had zero cost abstraction. So like we could write in these higher order ways and still have them compile down to, you know, zero cost stuff. But yeah, all of that at the time was, <laughs> it seemed like a really risky decision. And it was a risky decision, kind of paid off in retrospect, but it was a little scary. Earlier when we were talking, you talked about where you want to spend your innovation tokens, so to speak. Is your core competency building this 
plumbing between services or is it in the business logic of your application? In some ways, I could ask the same question with building a proxy. So the micro proxy that you built is incredibly performant. It's very secure. All those are facts. However, what was the reason that you all chose to build that rather than doing pretty much like everybody else and using Envoy? What was the business reason, I guess, that made you all want to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. And Linkerd is a weird project. Well, weird sounds bad. It's unique. It's very unique in the service mesh space. You know, a lot of these projects, I know you said we shouldn't compare them, but you know, they kind of start to blend together. It's like, you know, they all kind of feel pretty similar. And Linkerd is out here with a very different approach to a lot of this. And primarily that approach and our ability as a project to be so much simpler and faster and lighter, and I would argue to have the best security kind of foundations are due to that investment in our micro proxy. And the reason we call it a micro proxy is because it is not like Envoy. You know, Envoy is a general purpose kind of Swiss army knife. You can use it for all sorts of things. You can use it at the edge. You can use it in sidecars. You can use it in a central like proxy. I don't know. You can do a hundred different things with it. And because of that, it's complex, right? And that's not a knock on Envoy. It does a lot of different stuff and it has a lot of different features. And Linkerd, our little proxy, which we just call Linkerd2-proxy, is a very boring name, doesn't do anything except act as a sidecar service mesh. And so that allows us to strip out all the complexity around all those use cases that we don't need and to be really, really focused on just serving the kind of minimum that we absolutely need to do. Because remember, these proxies are inserted everywhere. You're getting two of them between every single hop. So every byte we can shave off there, every millisecond we can reduce from the latency. It's really, really important. So I would argue that, yeah, 100%, this is part of our core value prop is that we are adding these proxies everywhere. It's kind of this invasive thing. We want to make sure that they are not just fast and they're not just light, but that they are built in this very secure framework so that you can do, you know, this very, you know, <laughs> it's a scary thing to add a service mesh to your system. You were putting it in this very sensitive part. You know, you are vulnerable to what this thing does. Every single request is happening and your application is going through these proxies. So we really want to give you something that you can have a lot of confidence in. Yeah, totally. Totally makes sense. It is your core competency. I do have one question on it, and that is, what does the community look like around it specifically? Obviously, there's a huge community around Envoy, Nginx, those communities. What about the micro proxy here? What does that community look like? Am I at risk because there's maybe not as large a community for it? Yeah. So the community around Linkerd2 proxy is the Linkerd community. It's not a separate thing. It's not designed to be reusable. You know, it's not designed to be like a separate part. You know, it's in the same repo. It goes through the same security audits that the CNCF funds. Everything's done in the open. You know, it's like a CNCF project. So we try and make it as transparent as possible, but it doesn't have its own community. What it does have, though, is simplicity. You know, I actually wrote a blog post about this recently, too. <laughs> Sorry, I keep referencing my own materials here. But, it, you know, I wrote a blog post called simply Why Linkerd Doesn't Use Envoy. And I go through kind of the play-by-play -play of each of those decisions. It's a question that we get asked a lot because Linkerd, you know, is unique and that it doesn't. But one of the things I look at is just kind of the size of the code bases. And, you know, Linkerd 2 proxy is something like a fifth the size of Envoy. You know, which is not a moral judgment again, but it's just a very different sort of project. So I know I've asked this question to Oliver before, but I'm going to ask it again because it's in my mind all over again. But for all the reasons that you just mentioned at the data plane, why go at the control plane? Yeah, well, because the requirements are actually pretty different there, right? The data plane, we want to be as fast as possible. We want to be as small as possible. Like we care about every millisecond and every byte used the control plane is much more relaxed about those requirements. You know, the control plane sits off to the side. It's not in the data path. And what we care about there primarily is, you know, can we interact with the rest of Kubernetes in a really nice way? And so being in Go meant that we could use the Kubernetes libraries directly and like that ecosystem was already there. And it's also, you know, as an open source project, we wanted to attract, you know, as many contributions as possible. We wanted to make it welcoming and friendly for everyone. And Go is a relatively easy language to pick up. So that part was attractive too. So different requirements in those two components ended up with different languages for us. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so I want to switch gears just a bit and talk a bit about security in the context of service meshes in general and then Linkerd in specific. 
So I believe with the latest versions 2.9.1, I think with 2.9, you introduced some new security constructs, some zero trust configurations, some things like that. So I thought it might be a nice space to talk. So I guess to first start off with, when you talk about security in a service mesh, how does the, I guess, attack vector, the change, does it change? Is it the same? Yeah. So, you know, I'll do my best to answer this. I'll put a big asterisk, which I always do when I ask this question, which is like, I'm not a security expert. I know what they tell me. I try and reason about it as best I can. But, you know, I am ultimately a little bit decoupled from the ground truth here. But what I know is that there's two things that we really focus on in Linkerd. And the first thing, which I think is hugely important, is actually not making the system worse. So whenever you add, you know, a component to a system, if you're actually introducing a vulnerability somewhere in there, if you're making it harder for the overall environment to be secure, then you've made things worse. And it doesn't matter what kind of fancy features you've added. If you have made things worse over here, then like the whole chain, you know, is only as strong as its weakest link. So a lot of what we do in Linkerd is purely trying to not make things worse. And that ranges all the way from, you know, making sure that we have a data plane that's written in Rust and, you know, has as many kind of security guarantees we can around your critical sensitive data, all the way to keeping the system as a whole really simple so that when you do add these features, the poor human being who actually has to configure this can build a mental model of how this thing works, can reason about it, you know, and can be presented with a set of intelligent defaults. We wanted to avoid was adding a lot of complexity to the system, especially around the security features where, you know, all of a sudden now it's hard to reason about. It's easy to make mistakes or maybe just so difficult that you never enable that stuff. So we wanted to, to minimize that and to make it so that whatever we did, you know, if we did nothing else, let's not make the system worse. Let's not make it more insecure or less secure. And then, you know, in terms of the actual features, the big one for Linkerd, I think, and most service meshes is around mutual TLS which means that, you know, as service A talks to service B over the network within a cluster, or even in 2.8, I believe, you know, across clusters, Linkerd will initiate and terminate TLS and verify the identity on both sides, which makes it mutual TLS. And, you know, we'll kind of handle all of that transparently. So the actual communication that's happening is not just encrypted, but, you know, we've kind of authenticated both sides so that A knows that it's talking to B and B knows that it is talking to A. Now, what's the actual attack vector that that protects against? You know, there's some, there's some, but it's not like a panacea, not by any means. You know, if someone still has access to the host, you know, someone still pops the host and it gets root on a node somewhere in the cluster, you know, it's not like this stuff really helps you. You can inspect the memory, there's a variety of other things you can do. So really what I think the value of that is, is around having a very straightforward mechanism for getting encryption in transit everywhere as easily as you can, and then having service identity in place and enforced by the platform. I think that's the real value. What does it look like to enable mutual TLS using Linkerd for an operator? Yeah, so you just install it. That's it. <laughs> it's on by default? Yeah, that's right. It's on by default. There's zero configuration. And that was the big push for us was that, okay, here is this thing. We believe it has value, but if you have to configure it, if you have to do a bunch of hard work, then you're either not going to do it or you're going to do it wrong. So it's on by default, zero config, you know, you're five minutes away. If you're running Kubernetes today, you're five minutes away from having mutual TLS between all your TCP connections. All you have to do is install Linkerd. And that was a big, big push for us, but it speaks right to our principles around not just simplicity, but around having security as part of the default feature set, not as a later add-on. Very nice. Well said. The only other thing I'd really add is that, you know, security is a very broad topic and there's a whole lot more to running a secure application in Kubernetes than adding a service mesh. So that is one thing that I believe is helpful, you know, especially when we start talking about zero trust and trying to move the security enforcement down to the most granular layer you can. But there's a lot more that you have to do that the service mesh can't help you with. So it needs to be part of a holistic strategy. So what's next? What's next for Linkerd? What's next for this whole service mesh industry? Where are we going now that we're all mutual TLS enabled? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gosh. For Linkerd itself, there's one 
kind of big feature set that we really have our eyes on in the short term. So, you know, upcoming, we've got 2.10 and 2.11. 2.10 is primarily going to be focused on minimizing, even more minimizing the control plane and making it modular so that you can install even smaller and smaller and like more and more stripped down versions of Linkerd. And that's important to us because we are a big believer in doing the minimum amount necessary, right? It's like, we don't want to have the global kitchen sink project that can solve all things for all people. We want to give you the bare minimum that you need to build a secure and reliable Kubernetes system. So after 2.10s, 2.11, and then we will get to policy finally, which we've been wanting to get to for a long time. And actually is kind of very topical to security as well. So policy means, you know, right now Linkerd basically allows every request to happen. If A wants to talk to B, Linkerd will do its best to make that request happen. Once we have policy in there, we'll give you the ability as the operator to restrict things, to say A is not allowed to talk to B, or it's only allowed to call these calls, or like it has to satisfy these conditions or, or whatever it is. And then after that, you know, I think the remaining set of hurdles for us are really around expanding Linkerd. So can we get the micro proxy to run outside of Kubernetes? Can we give you the ability to incorporate kind of more and more things into the same operational paradigm? That's kind of the Linkerd roadmap at a very rough sketch. Understood. All right. We're about to wrap up. Just to give you a little bit of a softball pitch, I have heard of Buoyant Cloud's commercial product, I believe, but what's that all about? Yeah. So this is tied to what we believe kind of the future of the service mesh is, which is, you know, to become really boring so that what we can start focusing our time and energy on is what sorts of things can we build on top of the service mesh. So Buoyant Cloud builds on top of Linkerd to provide a dashboard for platform owners, the same audience who are adopting Linkerd, you know, and it allows them to solve kind of the rest of the story, right? So the service mesh here is playing a role. It's providing metrics. It's providing you know, kind of mutual TLS and Buoyant Cloud is then tying that to everything else that's happening in your Kubernetes cluster. So that's an example of the sorts of thing that I think has got to be the future of the service mesh. We've got to make the infrastructure itself very, very boring so that we can, you know, get back to the work that we actually want to do, which is building these platforms that are reliable and safe and resilient and flexible that, you know, we can then launch our business logic on top of that. All right, William, thanks for joining me on the InfoQ podcast. Thanks, Wes. It's great to be here.